This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston and our neighborhood churches, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. Good morning. Welcome to Mosaic. My name is Jan, one of the pastors here at Mosaic. And if you're new or if you're visiting, welcome. We're so glad you're here. And we'd love to connect with you if you'd like to. Uh, we do that through the connection card and the worship guide if you fill it out legibly and then toss it into the offering basket after we'll get in touch with you over the course of the week. We also have an app which also has a connection card and you can fill it out there. Um, all the announcements are in the worship guide. One thing, I forgot to highlight this in the first service. Today marks our seventh anniversary as a church. So pray, praise God. Praise God. Raise your hand if you were here that first Sunday in the YMCA. Raise your hand. Edgar, I see that hand. I see that one soul hand too. Um, praise God. Uh, today also marks the first birthday or the first anniversary of Mosaic Boston Jamaica Plain. Uh, so we are here in the beginning. Uh, we just want to thank God for his mercy and his faithfulness. And we ask for more uh, mercy and blessing upon this church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are a great God, that you have revealed yourself to us, that you have sent your son Jesus Christ who came in the flesh in time and space. And Jesus, we thank you that you suffered in our place on the cross and you didn't stay dead. And because you emptied the tomb we know that life is full of meaning and purpose and hope. Lord, I pray that you continue to bless this church. We thank you for planting it. We thank you for everyone who selflessly and generously, sacrificially has served and has prayed and has given. And I pray that you bless them. Continue to bless us. Continue to anoint us by the power of the Spirit. Make us a force for your kingdom here in the city, a force of love and hope and purpose so that people are reconciled with you and they realize that there's nothing greater than being reconciled to the God of the universe who loves us and calls us children. Lord, we also pray for Mosaic Boston, Jamaica Plain. Uh, we pray for Pastor Ivy. We pray for the, the team there. Continue to build them up uh, and continue to bless them. Bless our time in the Holy Word. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. So if you knew, we're going through a sermon series that we're calling Jesus Among Other Gods. And the reason why we're in this series is because we recognize that we as Christians are the minority in this city. It's about 2-3% uh, genuine, authentic believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So we understand there's lots of different worldviews vying for the Christian worldview. And one thing that we want to show is that there is good reason to believe that Christianity isn't just the greatest faith, it's also the truest faith, it's, it's good, it's true, it's beautiful, the things that, that we long for with our mind and hunger for with our soul. So we looked at the major world religions, last week we looked at the Christian cults, today we are looking at um, how, how Jesus speaks to the modern atheists. And, and why, why do we call them the, the modern atheists? Because it, since uh, 2004, there really has been this resurgence of atheism. And it, it's really, it's nothing new. It's the same old ideas. But what is new is the tone uh, and, and the ambition. So back in the day, the, the old atheists, you know, Hume and Voltaire, what, their goal was to get religion out of the public square. And Largely, they've succeeded. Nowadays, modern atheists, their ambition isn't just to get rid of religion from the public square, but to get rid of it from everywhere, get rid of any vestiges of it, even in your own life. Sam Harris, in 2004, he wrote The End of Faith, and he called Christianity actually a mental illness. And that book, it was a bestseller, New York Times bestseller, on that list for 30 uh, uh, 30 weeks, and then Christopher Hitchens came out with God is Not Great. Richard Dawkins came out with The God Delusion. Daniel Dennett came out with the Breaking the Spell. And, and what happened was they really sparked this, this uh, interest in atheism. And I, I don't believe that they succeed in converting people to their atheistic non faith. I, I don't, because it's so, the implications are so stark. Because if you get rid of God, 
living in that vacuum of nihilism is almost impossible. It either leads to stoicism or suicide. So I don't think they, they succeed there. But what they do succeed in is showing enough doubt where people go from being believers in Christianity, for example, to agnostic. And that's why the, the biggest group uh, that's growing in the United States is the nuns or the unaffiliated, the N-O-N-E-S, not nuns, N-U-N. But, but it's, it, it's people who, who just say, I don't believe in anything. And what the atheists do is they provide cover for people to say, yeah, who can know? And that's convenient because we have this tendency, innate tendency as human beings to shape truth to fit our desires instead of vice versa. So today what I, I want to do is, my goal today is to show you that it's reasonable to believe in Christianity. That's my ultimate goal. I'm, I'm going to read uh, Romans 1, 16 through 32, and it's a text. Uh, so usually if you come to Mosaic, we're big believers in expository preaching where we get into a text and just, you know, just uh, unwrap it. Well, one of the things, I'm, I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to read it, and I want to use this as the backdrop for our conversation about um, atheism. Romans 1.16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it's written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decrees that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is the reading of God's word. One of the things that text shows us is that the fact that God is, that God exists, it's so embedded into our soul that what he's appealing to is just, you know. If you're truly honest with yourself, you know that God exists. Three points uh, are going to frame up our conversation. Number one, we'll talk about the faith of atheism. Then we'll talk about the evil of atheism. And number three, we'll talk about the em emptiness of atheism. First of all, the faith of atheism. I start here because what the modern atheists do is they mock Christians. They, 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 through intellectual snobbery, they say if you believe in Christianity, if you believe in this Jesus, if you're a Jesus lover, Jesus follower, you are an imbecile, you are an idiot. How could any educated people believe this? That God inspired some book, that God became a person, that God was born of a virgin, that God died, that, God, that Christ came back. You, you got to be an idiot. And what, and what they do is they juxtapose and, and reason against faith. They pit reason against faith. That if you're smart, 
that you do not believe. The first thing I want to point out is atheism is an ideology. It's a belief system. I believe that atheism itself is a religion and a terribly substantiated religion at that. It's not a good religion. It's a bad religion. So here I just want to point out some of their belief statements. Belief number one, the material is all there is. And I call it a belief because how do you know that the material is all there is? Well, I use my senses, which tell me that the material is all there is. What if there's something more than just the five senses? What if there's a sixth sense? What, how do you know, right? So material is all there is. Carl Sagan said the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould, he, he puts it starkly like this. He says, we're here because one odd group of fishes had a, a peculiar fin anatomy that could transform into legs for terrestrial creatures. Because comets struck the earth and wiped out dinosaurs, thereby giving mammals a chance not otherwise available. So thank your lucky stars in the literal sense. We'll get to that later, this desire to thank someone. Because the earth never literally froze entirely during the ice age, because a small and tenuous species arising in Africa a quarter of a million years ago has managed so far to survive by hook and by crook, we may yearn for a higher answer, but none exists. The answer, though super, this answer, though superficially troubling, if not terrifying, is ultimately liberating and exhilarating. We cannot read the meaning of life passively in the facts of nature. We must construct these answers ourselves from our own wisdom and ethical sense. There is no other way. The material is all there is. That's pr faith presupposition. Number two, science. And this right here, th this is a conversation stopper, probably the number one. If you have conversations with, with friends, it's like, uh, you don't believe. Why do you not believe in God? Science. Period. What do you mean by science? Which science? What kind of, of science? And atheists present themselves as the apostles of science. And by the way, Richard Dawkins is not a philosopher. He's not a theologian. He's a biologist. Yet he's writing books on theology and philosophy. So science, and, and here's how the argument goes. Back when we were primitive, we did not know how the world worked. So we had to invoke the supernatural to explain natural phenomena, like lightning, for example. But now science has revealed how things work. Lightning, for example, is electrical discharge, so we don't have to say that God is up in the heavens, you know, throwing down lightning and things like that. So we don't need God. But that science and faith dichotomy, that's a modern myth. Science actually started uh, was started by Christians, the whole idea of like we should study this world. Why? Because God is a, is a, a God who reveals himself through the natural. Here, here's the problem with science. It does explain how things work, but people take that science that explains how things work, they explain lots of things about life, and it morphs into scientism where you look to science to answer everything. Not just how, but also why. And science cannot answer that question. Just for example, science knows that there's natural laws. It cannot explain why there's natural laws. It cannot explain why the world is as orderly as it is. And then ultimately it cannot explain why there's something other than nothing. Why, why, why? It can't. It, it's like it's like taking the iPhone. If you can explain to me why the iPhone works, uh, how the iPhone works, that does not get rid of the existence at one point of Steve Jobs. And, and uh, using the science argument, it's, it's as if my kids, I have four kids and they're really smart. It's, it's as if they figured out where the food comes from from the refrigerator and, by ver and make the leap that mom and dad don't exist because we know how the house works. That's, what, that's the leap that people make. Um, David Berlingsky, who is a, a physicist and uh, he's an agnostic, he's not even a believer, but he critiques the science, scientism 
perspective in, in uh, his response to the God delusion. He, he calls it the devil's delusion. Uh, and this is what he says in the book. Has anyone provided a proof of God's inexistence? Not even close. Has quantum cosmology explained the emergence of the universe and why it is here? Not even close. Have the sciences explained why our universe seems to be fine-tuned to allow for the existence of life? Not even close. Are physicists and biologists willing to believe anything so long as it is not religious thought? Close enough. Has rationalism and moral thought provided us with an understanding of what is good, what is right, and what is moral? Not close enough. Has secularism in the terrible 20th century been a force for good? Not even close to being close. Is there a narrow and oppressive orthodoxy of thought and opinion within the sciences? Close enough. Does anything in the sciences or in the philosophy, in their philosophy, justify the claim that religious belief is irrational? Not even ballpark. Is scientific atheism a frivolous exercise in intellectual contempt? Dead on. That's what I want to say, but it sounds really offensive. As a Christian, i got to be nice, so that's why I quoted that guy. <laughs> Number three, everything from nothing, that's a belief. We as Christians, we believe in creation out of nothing. It's creation ex nihilo, but we believe that someone created everything out of nothing. That's what we believe. Atheists come in, and this is why I say it's a religion, it's a worldview, because they have their own creation story. And their creation story goes like this. No one created everything from nothing. Science tells us that the universe has a beginning. And the theory goes that it's the Big Bang, right? That's what, what atheists say is that nothing led to the Big Bang. What we as Christians say, yeah, the Big Bang, that's great. As long as there's a Big Banger in the beginning where God said bang and then everything happened. That's the, the so this is the question that you gotta, you gotta ask. How do you know, my dear atheists, how do you know that everything came out of nothing? Has that ever happened before? No, it's faith. And it's not even based on good evidence. I was at a lecture, uh, this, this evolutionary biologist from Brown University, he's a world renowned, Ken Miller is his name. And at the end of his lecture, someone came up to the microphone and they said, how do you account for the beginning of the universe? And his answer was, that question is above my pay grade. Intellectually dishonest. You need to say, I believe that nothing created everything. That's faith. Everything ultimately came from nothing. Order came from chaos. Harmony came from discord. Life came from non-life. Reason came from irrationality. Personality came from non-personality. Morality came from amorality. And then they say, now you have to figure out on your own the why. They're, it's just material. You're just here by accident. Everything that goes on in your brain is just a collocation of atoms and, and hormones. And they, You are just a machine, but you should figure out the purpose of life. So which view has more, is more reasonable? Which view requires more faith? I believe atheism requires more faith here. As well, belief number four, non-intelligent natural forces created intelligent life. The simplest life form on the earth contains the information equivalent of a thousand encyclopedias or one Wikipedia. That's the smallest, smallest life form. How did non-intelligence create intelligence? How did non-intelligence create information? Uh, the atheists would respond and they say, that, that the non-intelligent natural forces just did it. That require, what's the evidence? That requires faith. Number five, faith statement, belief statement. Your reason is reasonable. If, by the way, the, the mind has more neurons than the Milky Way has stars. The, the brain is the most complex object in the universe. 
And my question, like, if you believe we're just here by accident, and if you believe that the mind is just a result of mindless, unguided processes, why do you trust your mind? Why would you trust your thoughts? Why do you think that your reason is reasonable? Uh, here's Greg Banson in a work, uh, Does God Exist? A debate. He says, imagine a person who comes in here tonight and argues no air exists, but continues to breathe air while he argues. Now, intellectually, atheists continue to breathe. They continue to use reason and draw scientific conclusions, which assumes an orderly universe, to make moral judgments, which assume, assumes absolute values. But the atheistic view of things would, in theory, make such breathing impossible. They are breathing God's air all the time. They are arguing against him. How do you know your cognitive faculties are trustworthy? And then also related to that, how, how do you know that you can be objective, that you are not biased? Nietzsche, he said, that, he said, if you were to prove this God of the Christians to us, we should be even less, uh, less likely to believe in him. It is our preference that decides against Christianity, not arguments. And that right there is I, I love just the brutal honesty where he says, look, it's not just about the intellect. My disbelief is rooted not in the intellect. It's rooted in the will. I don't want to believe in God. Uh, Thomas Nagel is a sociologist from New York University. He said, it isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. This cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition. John Lennox, if you, if you don't know who John Lennox is, you, you got to you find this guy on YouTube. He's got three, P, I think it's three PhDs. And he's at Oxford University. He's a professor. He's so good. He, and he's like the nicest guy. He's like Santa Claus who believes in Jesus. And, but he, like if you watch his debates, like in a very, this is why I, I, I probably, I'm not, I wouldn't be a good debater because I, would, I wouldn't be as nice. I try to. I'm, I'm working on it. But I, I need Jesus. But he, like, he comes at you with the truth in the nicest way. This is what he said. Atheists like to say that Christianity is a fairy tale for people who are afraid of the dark. I suggest that atheism is a fairy tale for people who are afraid of the light. Owned. Savage John Lennox. Belief number six, Jesus did not rise from the dead. Like, we believe that as Christians, and we don't just believe it as a faith statement. We believe that this is a fact. That in space, in time, at one point, Jesus physically came back from the dead. When we believe there's good evidence for it, and this is what Christians say, that if you look at Old Testament prophecy written hundreds of years before Jesus Christ, they, they predicted that he would be born in a certain town, in a certain way, from a certain bloodline, that he would live a certain life, he would die a very particular death. His hands and feet were pierced, that's Psalm 22, and that he would rise from the dead. But that's not the only line of evidence that we have as Christians. We also have eyewitness accounts. How do you account for the beginning of Christianity? That Jewish people, the, the last people on the face of the earth to believe that a human being could be God. They have the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They believe that Jesus Christ is God. They saw him come back from the dead. Sparked a movement that transformed the Roman Empire. How do you account for that? And if you're an atheist, we, I believe it takes more faith to not believe that than it does to believe. I, I believe the multiple lines of evidence bring you to a conclusion where it's beyond a reasonable doubt that Christ came back from the It's more probable that Christ came back from the dead, and ancient historians and writers confirm these events, and archaeology corroborates it. Belief number seven, for the atheist, love and beauty are not true. If you are a consistent atheist and we're just machines, then love is just hormones and atoms, and you're just a machine, and you don't have free will, it's all determinism. So if you fall in love, it's all fake. It's all an illusion. That's why I tell people don't date atheists. Don't do it. 
most unromantic people in the world don't do it. Or they're the biggest liars in the world. If you're going to be consistent. Love is fake and so is beauty. What is beauty if the physical is just physical? If you look at a painting, what is that? It's, it's just canvas and a piece of wood and some paint. What is that? Beautiful. There's no such. This is why atheistic like countries with atheistic ideology, for example, former Soviet Union, this is why they don't have an aesthetic. They don't, it's all pragmatism. If you look at the architecture from the Soviet Union, it's disgusting. It's the most disgusting buildings ever. It all looks like t uh, City Hall in Boston. It's all of that. And then you go to the, like cities, like the, most of Moscow is like that. And then you look for uh, St. Petersburg, for example, before atheism, before the Soviet Union. It's the most beautiful architecture there was. What was that architecture influenced by? By Christians who believed in beauty. B beauty exists. Truth exists. Goodness exists. That's why some of the greatest poetry ever was written by, by Christians. Some of the be most beautiful music is by Christians. And what atheists do is they read poetry and they pretend that poetry doesn't have an author. They listen to music as if it doesn't have a, a singer. They, they, it, it, that's the same thing that they do when they look at the sunrise or the sunset. You're, if you're honest, you're moved by it. You're moved by beauty. And what you want to say, what just erupts, involuntarily erupts from your soul is, thank you. Wow. Awe. Amazement. That you want to say thank you to someone. There's no one to say thank you to. That's why I love Thanksgiving. Everyone's thankful. Who are you thankful to? Right? God has created us in his image. Every time an atheist looks in the mirror, it's proof of an author. So they believe it's not true, unfortunate. And belief number eight, and this is the last one I'll say, why eight beliefs it's random, just like atheism, the heart of atheism. So number eight is there is no judgment. And this is also agnostics where like, yeah, I don't know. You know, you can, one religion, another religion, it doesn't matter. But the assumption behind that is I, no one will hold me accountable for my life. No, I will not stand in judgment before God. That's faith. That too is faith. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. One, one poet says, mock on, mock on, Voltaire Rousseau. Mock on, mock on, tis all in vain. You throw the sand against the wind and the wind blows it back again. So that's the faith of atheism. It is faith and it's unsubstantiated faith. And then what are the, concept, what are the implications of true atheism and I, I'm going to argue it's evil. And, and world history proves it. Uh, Dostoevsky, he, he said, what he's saying is, if there's no God, everything is permissible. I speak Russian. I throw it out once in a while. Street cred. Because, because Russians are the least likely people to believe in God, I really do believe that. So it's a miracle I'm a Christian. It's by God's grace. Um, so, and what he's saying is, look, if there is no God, if there's no one to hold you accountable, if there's no, if there's no moral code and there's no moral law giver uh, and there's no judge, you can live any way that you want and power is all that matters. There's no such thing as the true, the good, and the beautiful. So equality and justice and liberty, it's all subjective, it's all fake, it's all about power. And, and that whole temptation, that, that the temptation to not believe doesn't come from your professor in college who mocked the faith. It comes much earlier. Uh, it actually came from the enemy in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3.1. This is a story, now a serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? What is that? That's cynicism. He's sowing cynicism, sowing doubt. He's not providing any answers. He's not providing a different worldview. He's just questioning um, the trustworthy of God. Did God really say that you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the, tree, of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows 
that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The first temptation wasn't to eat an apple. By the way, we don't even know if it's an apple, it's fruit. The first temptation was to usurp the throne of God. You can be your own God. That's the heart of atheism. Atheism was at the very beginning. Get rid of God, dethrone him, and you become God. You become the law giver. You become the one who defines what is good and what is evil. And then it's all subjective. There's no such thing as absolute morality. And if there's no such thing as absolute morality, there's no such thing as absolute uh, evil. And, and evil then is just made up. And we all dance according to our DNA. That's why atheism is incapable of presenting a coherent form of morality, a coherent system of morality. It's just ruthless power. That's what's at the heart of atheism. That's why The atheistic worldview has led to more bloodshed, murders, and and genocide than anything else in the history of the world. And one of the charges that that is leveled against Christianity is that, hey, we got to get rid of religion because it leads to so much warfare. And and that's a false, that's a false, so here's just some numbers. Philip Axelrod, he wrote this monumental work called the Encyclopedia of Wars, and he chronicles all the wars from 8,000 BC to the modern era. And if you tally up all of the wars, only 7% were wars that, that were in the name of religion. And then if you get rid of the wars that, that were started by Islam, only 3.2% of the, percent of the wars in all the history of the world were due specifically Christian causes and even of those 3.2 percent we would christians would say that has nothing to to do with christ the crusades have nothing to do with christ it was all a power play and they used religion and christianity as an excuse however from the year 1900 to 2017 150 million people were killed by atheistic governments And you know the response of of atheists to this? They say, but it wasn't done in the name of atheism. It doesn't matter. It's the natural outworking of your faith. And it was done in the name of self, which is atheism. That you get rid of God and you put self at the center. And that was the ideology of Stalin. It was the ideology of Hitler, of Pol Pot. And you can just go down the list. A lot of people say Hitler was a Christian. He wasn't. This is what Hitler says about Christianity. He says the heaviest blow that ever struck humanity was the coming of Christianity. Our epoch will certainly see the end of the disease of Christianity. Nietzsche's writings so shaped Hitler that he had copies sent of Nietzsche's work to Mussolini and to Stalin. And then Stalin ended up slaughtering even more uh, uh, people than Hitler. Uh, Viktor Frank, who actually lived through the Holocaust, he was in two concentration camps. When he came out, he wrote this, and he's not a Christian, um, but it's a powerful quote from the doctor in the soul. He says, if we present a man with a concept of man, which is not true, we may well corrupt him. When we present man as an automaton of reflexes, as a mind machine, as a bundle of instincts, as a pawn of drives and reactions, as a mere product of instinct, heredity, and environment, we feed the nihilism to which modern man is in any case prone. I became acquainted with the last stage of that corruption in my second concentration camp, Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were the ultimate consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity and environment, or as the Nazi liked to say, of blood and soil. I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka, Majdanek, were ultimately prepared not in some ministry or other in Berlin, but rather at the desk and in the lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. I believe this is where our culture finds ourselves 
where the, the human uh, secularism and, and that worldview has led us to moral bankruptcy, which is being revealed in our political system. If there is no up and down, left and right is all we got. And it's being revealed by, by uh, some of the movements, come, specifically the Me Too movement, is revealing to us that men in power have been using that power to sexually abuse. That is the natural outworking of an ideology that if there is no God, we are just mammals, we're just animals, it's just meat. Therefore, whoever is in power can exercise that power over anyone else. That is atheistic ideology working itself out in our culture. And we see the evil consequences. Ben Sass, who is a senator from Nebraska, this past week on the Senate floor, he gave a profound speech about the Me Too movement. And this is what he said. He said, people, men and women, are created in the image of God. Imago Dei. As we say in Christianity, sexuality is a deep and precious gift. It is an intimacy. It is a oneness that is to be shared and given, never taken. Sex is big, not small, and you don't get to decide it for someone else. The Me Too movement is a complicated movement, but it has been a very good thing. Far too often, many girls and women have been told that they are me. They've been told this in word and in deed that they are parts to be consumed rather than God's children to be cherished and respected and partnered with. Where do you get the idea of human dignity, of human equality? Get it from Christianity. Get rid of Christianity. What do you have left? And the other thing I want to point out about the evil of Atheism, especially the modern atheists, the, the four horsemen of atheism, the, the modern guys, there's, a, there's an anger to it. There's a belligerence to it. And I believe that belligerence actually reveals something deep inside. Uh, I remember hearing a story from a pastor from Alabama that came up to preach at a small church in Maine. And people down, pastors down south preach differently than up here. There's more... Uh, hellfire and brimstone, there's more screaming, there's more, uh, yeah. it's like that, that episode of, uh, from The Office where Dwight, uh, d- you know, gives the uh, speech at the, whatever. So this guy gets up at a small church and he's just screaming at everyone. A little old lady at the end of the service comes up to him and, what, and she says, it was, it, was all, it was all good. She said, but who are you mad at? That's, this is what's going on with the modern atheists. It, there's just an anger and, and an intolerance, if you will, uh, almost as if they're fanatical, if, as if they're fundamentalist. Look, if you don't believe in something, if it's a silly superstition, like, for example, I don't believe in unicorns. I don't go around mocking unicorn believers. I don't go, you know, I'm not writing books like The End of Unicorns or The Unicorn Delusion He's like, no, you just you leave it alone. Let them believe, they believe in a unicorn. So why, why is it like the, this anger, this belligerence? It's like Stalin on his deathbed. The last thing that he did was he, he got up in his deathbed and he shook his fist at the ceiling. Why? What, what is this? What's behind it? C.S. Lewis, in 1945, he wrote uh, this work called The Hideous Strength. And in it, there's this one scene of a non, the non-religious protagonist he's a student and his professor gives him an assignment he gives him a a large image of the crucifix and he says I want you to trample this and the guy responds he's like I don't believe this why would I trample this it's just it's superstition I just want to leave it alone and this is what the professor says he says of course it's a superstition but it is that particular superstition which has pressed upon our society for many centuries An explicit action in the reverse direction is therefore necessary towards complete objectivity. And that, what he, like, what he did was he predicted our current age where where people outright, the atheists mock and they ridicule. Um, Dawkins, in in 2012, they held this 
thing called the Reason Rally. 10,000 people showed up in Washington, D.C. at the National Mall. And this is what he said. He said, mock them, Christians. Ridicule them in public. Don't fall for the convention that we're all too polite to talk about religion. Uh, Ravi Zacharias was asked, he said, what, what do you think about, uh, you know, uh, Dawkins' statement. Ravi Zacharias is a great Christian apologist, probably the greatest of our day. He says, I, I'd like to see Richard Dawkins say the same thing in Saudi Arabia. So at that point, he, he'll find out all religions are not the same. But for some reason, like, it's okay to mock Christians. It's okay to use Jesus Christ as a curse word. Where, where, why? Why this, this anger against Christianity, well, I, I think it, 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 it's deep inside. It's, it's Genesis 3. It's our deep desire to get rid of the judge. You get rid of the judge. You get rid of the rules. You can live any way you want, as Dostoevsky said. But ultimately, what are we left with if we believe in atheism? Just emptiness. That's all you have is emptiness. Um, they ask questions with no answers. The story goes that Albert Einstein was on a plane. I don't, I don't do these stories often, unless they're good. The story goes that Albert Einstein is on a plane, he's really bored, he starts talking to the guy next to him, this guy, was, uh, he's Indian, and Albert Einstein says, look, we got a long flight, let's play a game. I'm rich, and I got a lot of cash on me, let's play this game. I ask you a question, if you can't answer it, you give me $50. And then you ask me a question. If I can't answer, I'll give you $500. And the Indian guy, he thinks, he's like, yeah, Albert Einstein's much smarter than I am. But he knows some stuff about religion and culture and philosophy. Maybe I could stomp him and, you know, the odds are pretty good, you know, 10 to 1. So Albert Einstein, he says, he asks the guy, what is the distance between the earth and the moon? The guy's like, yeah, I don't know. You got me. And then I said, okay, your turn. And the guy says, what goes up a mountain with three legs and comes down the mountain with four? And Einstein thinks about it. He's like, I have no idea. Dishes out $500. And then Einstein says, look, before, before I ask my next question, what goes up a mountain, three legs, and comes down with four? And then the Indian guy starts counting out $50 to give to Albert Einstein. <laughs> That's atheism. That's atheism. It, it's, it's the intellectual snobbery of your professor ridiculing your faith and not being honest about their own faith, that is still faith. And it's all rooted in the will. It's all rooted in desire. G.K. Chesterton, he said that Christianity, at the heart of Christianity is joy. And peripherally, there's sorrow. So, but atheism has it flipped around, that at the heart of atheism, just emptiness, it's sorrow, and then peripherally, they experience joy. Why? Because of the most foundational questions of, of where did everything come from? Who am I? And then the ultimate question of whose am I? Do I belong to someone? We're like cosmic orphans asking who is my father? Do I have a father? And Christianity says, yes, we have a God who loves us. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, in time, in space who came and he died for our sins to redeem us. Therefore, the crux of Christianity, the fundamental of Christianity is sacrificial love. So when atheists say we're against fanatics, we're against fundamentalists, I am too if your fundamental is wrong, if your fundamental is pride, if your fundamental is power. Our fund fundamental is, is God on a cross dying for us. Love, truth, beauty, equality, liberty, all things that God has uh, given to us. And why did Christ come? He came.
to redeem us from that evil inside. When atheists run from God, this is why I read Romans 1. The judgment for suppressing truth is evil. It's evil upon evil. God just relinquishes us, gives us up to our sinful desires, and that's the scariest thing possible. In the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they practically killed God. It's, it's perhaps not a full-blown theoretical atheism, it's a practical atheism. Many of us are there where we live as if God doesn't exist or his opinion about us doesn't matter. We live as if we gave ourselves life and sustain our life. And God came and God allowed himself to be killed again, literally, in order to give us life, in order to redeem us from the sin inside, from that desire to be our own gods. We're not good at it, and we, we mess up the world around us um, by virtually killing God. This is the hope of Christianity, that you, when you place your faith in Christ, when you place your faith in the fact of who God is, that he redeems us from our evil, saves us from our sins, and, and adopts us into his family. If you are not yet a Christian, I invite you to start a conversation with God. It's, it's kind of awkward to talk about God when he's here. He's here now. Have a conversation to him. If, if you don't believe in him, just try this. Say, God, if you exist, reveal yourself to me. And he will. If you are a Christian, uh, we welcome you today to uh, celebrate the gospel by celebrating Holy Communion. Holy Communion is uh, a reminder to us of what God did in order to redeem us. Um, if you're not a, a Christian, we ask that you refrain from this part of the service. It'll do nothing for you. Uh, the usher is going to hand out the elements. The bread symbolizes the body of Christ broken for us, and the cup symbolizes the blood of Christ shed for us. Hold on to the elements, uh, elements as, uh, until everyone's received them, and then we'll partake uh, together. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for Holy Scripture. We thank you that you are God who has revealed yourself to us through creation and then ultimately through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we do confess that often it's convenient for us to live as if you don't exist because of this desire to define good and evil on our own. Lord, we recognize that proclivity, that tendency, that bent toward insubordination and rebellion, and we repent of it. And we thank you for Christ who came, who was completely obedient, that who rose from the grave, left the tomb empty to show us that life doesn't have to be. Lord, bless our time in Holy Communion. Pray this in your name. Amen.